So uh, yeah, I'm going to lead off on our session on seeing and is believing with uh, uh, viewing the biological world with x-rays and magnetic fields. And I'm the x-ray person, and Lawrence will be talking about the magnetic fields. But before I get into x-rays, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the scale that we work on. So we're, we both are interested in understanding biology at a molecular level, or understanding how the actual molecules themselves work. And we do structural biology at an atomic level. So first, I'm going to just show um, something I did just for fun. Um, I took some cheek cells, and I put them under a standard light microscope, and uh, first stained them. And you can see uh, they're about 30 microns big. They have a nice little stained nucleus. And scattered all over them are these little specks. And those are the bacteria that normally live in our cheeks. Okay, and I'm interested in bacteria. I'm a microbiologist. And so light micros microscopy is, is not an ideal tool for looking at uh, bacteria because they're, they're a little bit small for the scale um, that light microscopy is normally used for. So what uh, bacteriologists often use for looking at bacteria is electron microscopy. So here's an EM micrograph of a bacteria. And we can start seeing features like the cell wall and some of the extracellular matrix, the, the parts of the, bac the bacteria secretes. And here's the inside of the bacterial cell. Uh, but we still don't see a great deal, deal, a lot of detail. So we want to go to the next level and look at things at a, at a molecular level. So what I'm going to do is just show you a little video that just takes you from um, a grain of rice down to the molecular level, just to give you a sense of, of the scale that we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to look at. Okay, So I'll just play this little video. Oops. OK. Okay, so here's our grain of rice, and we're going to zoom in to a human egg cell, which is one of the largest cells in our body, down to a relatively small cell, a red blood cell. Okay, and then we're going to look at a cell organelle, a mitochondrion. We're going to keep zooming in, look at an HIV virus. Okay, now we're starting to approach the molecular level, and here's our first molecule, so it's a human antibody, and we'll zoom in one more time. Just to look at a very small molecule, here's a water molecule. Okay, so what I want to really emphasize is that we're zooming right in down to the molecular level. Okay? All right. So how are we going to do this with x-rays? Well, when we use x-rays uh, to, to look at biological material, we're actually doing an experiment that's very similar to that original sort of old-fashioned light microscope that I first, uh, first used to look at cheek cells. Okay, so we have a light source. We have a specimen holder where I put the cells. And then we have some lenses that allow us to look at those cells at a higher magnification. Okay? Now to look at, at biological molecules with a, a light source, we have to switch to something with a shorter wavelength. So light is not going to cut it to look at molecules. The wavelength is too long. We have to go to something much shorter. Uh, and in this case, we need x-rays. So the x-rays we use have a wavelength of around 1 angstrom. Um, and uh, so we're going to have to use something other than a light bulb. We're going to need a, a, a source of x-rays. We're going to need something to hold our sample. And even then, we're not going to be able to image the molecule directly because we don't have lenses. So no one has yet invented x-ray lenses. So we're going to have to use something else. The second problem we have is that um, as of yet, there isn't a source of x-rays that's intense enough to look at a single molecule at a time. So we need some way to amplify the signal. And the way that we do this is by growing crystals. So we take our protein molecules, our biological molecules, and we coax them to form crystals. And what a crystal is, is just ordering all the molecules in an array, or one right next to the other. And by creating this array, we then amplify the signal that, that we of the molecule that we're interested in. Okay. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do in, in terms of talking about the technology of, of getting structures with x-rays, I'm going to talk about the x-ray sources, because that's one of the areas where there's been um, a lot of advances. So first off, I'm going to talk about the x-ray source we have down the hall that we recently had, um, was funded by the uh, Canadian Foundation for Innovation through the Astrid program. So here's a, our x-ray source. It comes through here. There's a, a beam of x-rays that comes out this little collimator. And we put our sample right here. 
the x-rays hit the sample and we're going to get diffraction and we're going to record the image with this fancy camera at the other end. Okay? So just to remind you, um, we're actually, our sample is a crystal and because our x-ray beam is fairly intense, we loop these crystals in a little nylon loop and we flash freeze them in a nitrogen stream. So we're going to do this experiment at 100 Kelvin or minus 170 degrees Celsius. Okay, and that's just going to preserve our sample. All right. Now this works for many cases um, and we, we collect data here routinely. But oftentimes we're not able to get crystals that are big enough or diffract well enough to use on our home source. And so we're going to go and take our crystals to a much brighter source of light. And the, the, light, the source of, light source of choice for crystallographers, or X-ray crystallographers such as myself, is a synchrotron. So uh, this just shows you the relative brightness of the light from different sources. So if you go in for a medical X-ray, it's a relatively dim X-ray source, which is good because when we get an X-ray, we don't really want to be heavily irradiated. Right? We want this to be as minimum radiation as possible to get the image. Um, if we look at a candle, that's about um, a billion photons per uh, square millimeter. So that's a really bright si source of light. If you've ever stared at a candle, um, usually you see kind of little red spots afterwards. Okay? The next brightest source we can talk about is sun. We generally don't look at the sun too bright. Uh, but even that is orders of magnitude less bright than a synchrotron. Okay? So these are incredibly intense sources of light. And in this case, the light is at a wavelength um, to give x-rays. Okay, so I'm going to show you what, um, how a synchrotron works. Oops. Okay. Oh, I forgot to mention. Um, there's one more source of light that's just come on stream lately. Um, it's called an x-ray laser. There's only a few of these in the world. Um, and they produce even brighter light. And the light is so bright that the way they use these things is they actually fire a stream of crystals into the beam. The crystals vaporize instantly. And before the, the crystal is destroyed, they collect the x-ray diffraction pattern. But I won't talk about that, because I haven't even had a chance to try it out yet. Hopefully sometime soon. OK. Where we usually go is the Canadian light source. It's in Saskatoon. Um, and what the Canadian light source is, it consists of an x-ray or a, an electron gun or something called a LINAC, which accelerates those electrons. They get fired into a ring, and they go around this ring near the speed of light. And they're very powerful magnets that direct that elect those electrons around in a big circle. And the whole thing's housed in a building similar to an aircraft hangar. Okay, so it's a fairly large piece of equipment. And as you bend the x-rays around the ring, or sorry, as you bend the electrons around the ring, you generate x-rays. And these x-rays come down a path, a beam line, to where we put our sample. And then we can collect the data with a camera controlled by some computers. Okay, and so here's a couple people from my group in Saskatoon looking at the fraction patterns they've collected and making decisions about how to best collect their data. They're, they're obviously deep in thought, right? Um, so we've gone to the Canadian Light Source a number of times. but. Ideally, we like to be able to just send the crystals and control the synchrotron from home. And fortunately, uh, the field of crystallography has seen um, a certain degree of automization, just like many parts of science. And there's actually robots now that will mount your crystals on the beam line for you. And you can control the beam line from a, a web-based interface uh, just as if you're there. In fact, this is the same interface you would use if you were at the computer right at the synchrotron. It's just uh, beamed over the internet back to our labs. So we can control all the parameters of the x-ray beam. We can control the positioning of the crystal. So it's mounted right here and we can rotate it in any direction we want. And we can even control where the, where the camera sits. Okay, and then we can set up our, our data collection. So this has now become the new norm uh, for data collection as we use FedEx to send the crystals. Uh, the robot does all the mounting. We collect all the data bring it back over the internet, and somebody um, takes the cassette with all the crystals and ships it back to us. You don't have to even leave your own lab. Okay. All right. So that's a little bit about the technology. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we go from the data we collect 
to the actual structures or the, the pictures that we want to see. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into any great depth because I haven't got a lot of time, but uh, here's an example of a X-ray diffraction pattern from a crystal. It's a bunch of spots. And what we're actually measuring is the intensity of each of these spots. And from those intensities, we can use a computer to calculate the structure. Okay, so the computer is going to replace the lens. So here's our light microscope. We've got a really fancy light bulb. We use the synchrotron. We have a crystal instead of a flat sample. And now we want to get the image. We want to see something out the other end. And we're going to replace this part with a laptop. Okay. And using a lot of sophisticated software, a lot of knowledge of physics, we can go from this to an electron density map. Okay. Now, we don't actually see the, the atoms directly. What we see are the electrons in the, in the structure or in the molecule. And so we have to infer from where the electrons are where the atoms are. Okay? And if you want to have some idea of what these maps are like, um, you can think of them as a 3D version of a contour map. So within these cages is a certain level of electron density. So, so many electrons per cubic um, angstrom or nanometer, or something like that. Okay. So, in here, inside these cages is all the regions of high electron density, and outside in the white space here is low electron density. So now we're going to fit in a structure that um, makes sense for this electron density. And in this case, uh, we're able to model the center density with a metal, and then put in side chains and protein uh, backbone for the, for the rest of the structure. Okay? And I've just shown a little bit of density. We could actually calculate it for the, for the whole structure that you see here. Okay? Now, if you have a really good density map, um, a lot of this is, is quite obvious. And uh, people have even re written computer programs now that can do this in an automated fashion. So we're getting to the point where if you can grow the crystal, you can send it to the Canadian Light Source, and they'll run it through all their programs, and they'll send you back a, at least a partial structure without you having to do anything. Okay? And then you have to do the, the rest of the work. These are all the favorable cases. As, as it often is the case in science, not everything works as planned, and that's where all the knowledge and experience comes in. Okay. All right, so that's getting structures. So what I want to do in the last little bit of my section is just talk a little bit about the research or the, the structures that we're interested in in my lab. So my lab is interested in uh, Staphylococcus aureus. It's uh, one of the, the superbugs that we have difficulties with in society. It's a leading cause of hospital-acquired infections. And um, uh, here's just a, a little article from the Globe and Mail. It's a bit older uh, than some of the more recent scares about superbugs, but I like this article because it actually has a few facts. Uh, so it points out that about 8,000 people a year um, succumb to hospital-acquired infections, uh, and that's more than the, the total number of people who die from breast cancer and motor vehicle accidents combined. So this is a really serious problem, and it's exasperated by the fact that the use and abuse of antibiotics uh, has limited treatment options, and that makes people worried that this number could grow larger if we don't uh, either use antibiotics more judiciously or develop some new treatments. So my interest is in coming up with some new approaches to, to uh, controlling Staph aureus. And I just have a little stuffy uh, superbug that, that my kids like. So it relates to what dad does. OK. So what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the approach we take. Um, my lab is interested in how these uh, bacteria acquire iron. And you might ask, well, why should we care about why, how they acquire iron? Well, the human body is a great storehouse of iron, and they need iron to grow, just like we need our iron uh, for our metabolism. And our human body goes to great lengths to try and keep iron away from bacteria. So it produces a number of proteins whose sole purpose, or one of their main purposes, is just to scavenge iron away and keep iron um, away from the bacteria that want to infect us. So a professional pathogen like Staph aureus has to come up with some way of overcoming this nutritional immunity in our body. One of the methods they use is to acquire iron from hemoglobin. So if you get Staph in your blood, it'll try to lyse the red blood cells, the hemoglobin will come out, and the, um, 
The Staph aureus has specific receptors for human hemoglobin, and they're called ISDB and ISDH. They'll strip out the heme from the hemoglobin, and through a series of proteins that are all embedded in the cell wall of the, of the bacterium, they'll transport um, this heme into the cell where, it can, where the iron will be released by these other proteins down here. So we have a fairly uh, complicated system with many uh, components whose main purpose is just to extract heme from hemoglobin. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that we're interested in this system is this protein here, ISDB, is a vaccine component uh, that Merck had put into phase three trials. Uh, it's a vaccine that worked wonderful in mice, worked okay in primates, but so far hasn't demonstrated enough efficacy in people to be, to be brought to market. And they're uh, going back and looking at their data to try and figure out what to do next. Uh, but that alone, the fact that this is one of the leading candidates for a staph vaccine has uh, uh, encouraged a lot of people to do further study of this, of this protein. Okay. The other system that bacteria use to get iron is to secrete something called siderophores. So these are small molecules that are synthesized inside the cell. Oops. Here. There's one, for example. They're secreted. They go out into the environment and they have very high affinity for iron. So they'll strip iron out of any host protein or source that they can get, get in contact with. And then the iron-bound siderophores come back to the staph aureus, and there's this very specific receptor that binds the staphylopharin, as they're called, and takes them into the cell. Okay, so what I'm gonna focus on for the last little bit is just on this receptor, which I've drawn as a little Pac-Man. Uh, because at this point we don't know its structure, and we want to know how does this little Pac-Man here, staph uh, uh, receptor, recognize this siderophore? Okay, and this the receptor is called HTSA. Okay, so here's the crystal structure of HTSA. So we grew crystals of HTSA, we sent them to the synchrotron, collected the data, did all the computer analysis, and came up with this structure. And you're probably all looking at it and go, how do you make sense of that? Well. I would agree with you, it looks like a mess. So we're gonna simplify the structure to try and understand it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take off all the side chains and just look at the backbone. So here's the polypeptide backbone of HTSA. So you can see, see here there's a helix. Up here there's some strands. Um, this is still a little difficult to look at, so I'm just gonna take one atom from each amino acid or each unit in the polymer and draw a line from unit to unit to come up with an even simpler representation. So this shows you, again, you can see this helix. You can see the path that the polypeptide chain follows. So we've simplified it further. Um, we could even do better than this. We could come up with some cartoon representations of the different parts of the structure and draw this helix actually as a, a visual helix. We can draw the strands as little arrows and we can connect them with loops. Okay, so now we're starting to get to a representation that those of you who've taken any biology, you'll have seen this on the cover of textbooks or uh, in some people's descriptions of structure. Okay, it still looks a little bit like spaghetti, a little bit difficult to, to decipher, so we often color code the different parts uh, according to some scheme. So in this case, I've just done a very simple coloring of the beginning of the chain in blue and the end of the chain in orange, and then you go through the rainbow. Uh, to follow the chain, okay? All right, so this is a very common representation, but what we really want to know is how does this molecule recognize the siderophore, okay? So I'm just gonna drop it down here. We'll add in the siderophore. I've drawn the electron density just to show you what it, it looks like in the structure. And we're gonna look at the details of how the, this receptor recognizes that siderophore. Okay, so I've got another picture here, the same receptor. I've colored two regions of the molecule, blue and gold, and then drew in silver the little connecting helix. And let's take a closer look. Zoom in. So here's the siderophore bound at the interface between those sort of the blue domain and the gold domain. And now I'll add back in some of the detail that I stripped out to create this fancy picture. Okay, I'll add back in some of the side chains and I'll label them and I'll strip away all that uh, backbone, and we'll just look at 
the actual amino acids and all the specific interactions that lead to this receptor recognizing uh, a particular siderophore. Okay, so now we have a very detailed molecular description of the recognition process, and we can start probing the role of each of these amino acids in recognizing the siderophore. Um, and furthermore, we might even be able to understand how we could modify the siderophore uh, for our own purposes, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? It turns out that uh, the, the receptor changes conformation as it grabs hold of the siderophore. So just that Pac-Man image that I showed you in the beginning is fairly accurate. This, the receptor sort of is opened up to bind the receptor, uh, bind the siderophore, and then it closes in around it. So I'm just going to show you a little animation which shows that process. Okay, so I'll try to do that again. Okay, so this loop shown here in blue with this particular amino acid is um, swung out when the siderophore isn't present, and then it swings back in to bind the siderophore. Okay, and that little animation I showed you is, is not something that we have experimental evidence for. We know the beginning state and the end state from our crystal structures, and then the, the conformational change, the movie, is an interpolation. Okay, so a lot of what uh, structural biologists do is, is take the snapshots that we're able to get experimentally and try to interpolate what goes on in between. Okay, so lastly, I just want to talk about a couple of applications. So now that we know how the siderophore is bound by the receptor, maybe we can make modifications to the siderophore for our own purposes. And one of the, the areas that's um, under investigation is to link antibiotics to siderophores. So if we know where the, where the siderophore is grabbed on by the receptor and which parts are free or available to add on to, then we could make more informed choices of how to synthesize a connection between a drug and a siderophore. And there's a, a number of groups that have done this successfully. They've made linkages or made new molecules by linking a, a drug, an antibiotic, to a siderophore, and they've made these uh, antibiotics more potent. And so they're uh, imported into the cell. The drug gets imported along with the siderophore and then reaches its target and kills the cell. So you can kind of think of this as adding a little bomb to the food that, this, that the uh, organism is, is trying to digest. Okay? The other possibility is that we could even think of new antibiotics that wouldn't get into the cell on their own, but by linking them to a siderophore, we might be able to um, force their import into the cell. Okay? Um, there's even some naturally occurring antibiotics. So they were isolated from other organisms, just like penicillin was originally. And they've been shown to be effective against uh, uh, bacteria of interest to us, like E. coli or Staph aureus. Uh, the reason this hasn't met with a lot of commercial success so far is that it's actually quite difficult to make these molecules. So even though they're effective, uh, the cost of producing them hasn't led to them being commercially viable. Uh, one of the, the reasons why people might give, give this a second thought is that we now realize that a lot of the antibiotics we use are rather indiscriminate. So even though they work great at killing the Staph aureus or the E. coli that might be infecting us, they also kill a lot of other bacteria that are commensal in our, in our body. So for example, those bacteria that I showed you that live in our, in our mouths or the bacteria that live in our guts, um, those are bacteria that help us um, live healthy lives, whether it's, it's helping us digest our food or keeping a healthy environment. So by using antibiotics, we often um, kill some of these healthy bacteria, probiotic bacteria, along with the bacteria that, that we're trying to get rid of. These kind of drugs um, have the potential to be a lot more specific, since this siderophore uh, is only made by Staph aureus. And I think there's one other bacteria that makes it that's a plant pathogen, but un 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 of not concern to us. So, okay. Um, the last thing is there's some other, some other groups that have been trying to use siderophores um, as diagnostics. So the, one of the ideas they have is that if we uh, link siderophores onto a, a glass or gold-coated glass slide, um, we could then add a, a, a diagnostic sample, a blood sample or, or a urine sample or something like that, 
um, see which bacteria are captured by the siderophore, and then do some imaging to, to test which bacteria are present. Um, this has been shown to work for certain classes of bacteria, but I don't think it's as uh, broadly useful as one might hope. But it does give at least uh, proof of principle that we might be able to use siderophores as a way of diagnosing uh, the presence of a bacterium. Okay. So I just want to end by acknowledging uh, my group. So all of the work I've talked about is done by, uh, by people in my group. In particular, Jason Grigg is the person, student, who uh, did the crystal structure of HTSA, and uh, along with help from an undergrad, Cherry Mao. Uh, all these other people are, were present at the time or are currently present in the group. And I want to thank my two sons for helping me with that little video, which I wouldn't have been able to grab off of YouTube, invert, and put, use it too on my own. <laughs> And then lastly, uh, here's my group, and uh, some of them might be here to answer questions later on. Okay, thanks.